That's one more talk about knowledge-based programs. Uh, but uh, the main difference with the previous talk is that we have only one agent, so only one muddy, muddy child, uh, which uh, you might think would, would be obvious, but actually it's not, uh, especially because we take a different perspective. I mean, we want to use knowledge-based programs for artificial intelligence planning problems and for representing and solving uh, uh, planning problems. Uh, we had a previous paper last year uh, uh, that focused on plan verification and then we, we, we have this paper that focuses on succinctness and plan existence. Um, let's start with two simple examples. So the first example we have a card game, we want to build a single agent card game program and the goal is to, to try to obtain three cards of the same, the goal is to have three cards of the same rank okay? and we can pick maximum five cards. Uh, suppose that the, the first four cards picked are these ones. And is, it, is it still possible to reach the goal? You see that no, it's not possible to reach the goal. Uh, and, um, so uh, we could write a, a knowledge-based program that, that, that uh, tries to solve this problem. Uh, uh, that would be I mean, pick a card and look at the rank of, of the card and do that until three cards of the same rank have been picked or we know that it's not uh, possible to, that, it, that it has become impossible to, to obtain the goal. Um, uh, a second example which is a little bit more complicated is a diagnosis, a diagnosis problem. Uh, so we have three components, one, two, three. With each, of, each of these can be uh, okay or not okay, functioning or not functioning. Uh, so we have a propositional symbol for each of them. So OK, I means that component I is in working order. Uh, for each component I, we have a repair actions that makes OK, I true. And we have also a test action which returns the truth value of OK, I, which, which gives the information whether OK, I is true or false. Uh, then we have some initial knowledge state. So let's, th let's assume that we have this complex knowledge state which uh, uh, expresses relationship be re relationships between, s between failures of components. Okay, so we have, could have something like that. And the goal is to have the three components uh, uh, working and with, without replacing more components than necessary. Uh, and actually, we can work a very simple knowledge-based program, which actually is independent from the, the, the initial knowledge state. Uh, which does the following. Okay. Uh, why it is not the case that I know that all components are working? Do. Let me pick a component for which uh, I do not know whether it is functioning or not. Okay. Then I test this component. Uh, so, and then if I know that the component is not okay, uh, then I replace it. I may, so if, uh, it may also be the case that uh, uh, I skip this instruction because I, I, I know the, the state of, uh, of each component and, and of each component and some components are not okay. In that case, I, 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 will, I will repair them right away. And uh, actually this works. And, and uh, this is very simple to write. I mean, this is very, very short and, and this works. But actually there, there are, Drawbacks, or what are the drawbacks? Uh, we'll see that soon. Uh, okay, as, as you know, I mean, knowledge based programs were introduced uh, almost 20 years ago. They were introduced in, uh, for behavior specification in distributed environments. Uh, we, we sort of um, uh, specialize in knowledge based programs for one agent and, and we use them for. Uh, expressing and solving planning problems. And uh, uh, one of our goals is to compare, I mean, to, to see the, the, the benefits and drawbacks of using knowledge-based programs as plans compared to standard plans, compared to standard policies as known, as known in planning. Um, okay, so here's the, the, the plan. Okay, so the... First, we have to talk about the representation of our states and, and knowledge states and our actions. So, so we have a set of propositional symbols, x1 up to xn, uh, such as in our example, queen, queen of 
I mean, the card one is a queen, uh, component one is, is okay, and so on. A state is a truth assignment, is a, um, a variation function that assigns a truth value to all uh, propositional variables. And then we have a set of actions. Um, a knowledge based program is, a, is, a, is defined inductively by uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, an atomic action is a knowledge based program, so sequence of knowledge based programs is a knowledge based program, and also a branching, uh, a branching of knowledge based program is a knowledge based program. So a branching is if phi and phi 1 else phi 2, where phi is a purely subjective uh, S5 formula, uh, which is epistemically in interpretable. And we have also loops. We have uh, why phi do uh, phi 1, where phi 1 is a knowledge based program. Uh, again, Sorry? By epistemic atom, do you mean that phi? Uh, this is a epistemic atom, yeah. yeah. yeah uh, phi has to be closed. No, no, it, 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 uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an objective formula. Bec because we are in S5 with only one agent, uh, we, we don't need nested formulas. Yeah. We have only one agent. Yeah. Um, so then, actions. So we have two, ty two types of actions, uh, which is classical in AI planning. Uh, we have physical or ontic actions, and then we have epistemic actions. Ontic actions are meant to change the state of the world. They are possibly deterministic, possibly non-deterministic, and uh, importantly, they don't give any feedback. So, three examples of ontic actions: a, a, a simple assignment. I mean, uh, x i is assigned to zero is, is, is a very simple ontic action. Switch xi. So switch xi change the value of, of propositional variable xi, and it will be expressed this way. Okay, so xi prime represents the, the 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 variable xi after the action, and xi represents the, the variable before the action. Okay? So we say is that after the action, uh, xi uh, has the opposite value as it had before, okay? and all other variables keep the same value. Uh, we have also this non-deterministic action, Reinit xi, that uh, says that all variables except xi keep their value and uh, xi can have any new value, okay. keep its value or change. Yeah. Now, an epistemic action does not change the state of the world, but it is meant to give some feedback. It, it, it is meant to bring some new knowledge to the agent. Uh, it, this is uh, expressed by means of a set of possible observ observations. Yeah. So this, the simplest epistemic action is, a, is the, the, a binary test. For instance, test xi or xj would send the feedback xa or xj or not xa or xj, would say uh, yes or no. Okay. And then we have non-binary uh, epistemic actions, such that, uh, for instance, this one, I mean, ask how much time left, which, would, uh, uh, which is a... a measure actions which would give the, the value of a non-binary variable. Yeah. Hans, how much time left? Um, enough. Enough, okay. Sorry. <laughs> you were not following. 20. <laughs> no, no, <it's> not <laughs> you were not expecting the question now. <laughs> uh, now, uh, executing a, a, a knowledge base so now I'm uh, so instead of uh, knowledge based program, I'm going to, to use more and more the, the, the terminology knowledge based plan because this is wh wh why we are using knowledge based programs here right, to solve planning problems. Uh, so, so executing a knowledge based program or plan. Uh, so at every step, we, we, we have the current state of the variables that, that usually we don't know. And we have the current knowledge state, I mean, the agent has his, his current knowledge state, okay, which, which uh, we're in, in proposition LS5, so we know that uh, we, we, don't need, we don't need complex script key, script key structures. I mean, we, we can deal with sets of, of states. Okay. So the, the knowledge state is a, is, a, is a set of states, okay, which we can represent succinctly using uh, the logic of only knowing. So, so if this, this set of states is... Uh, this set of three states, I mean, this can be expressed compactly by all I know is x1 and x2 or x3. And then, so the execution of a knowledge based program, so when uh, the, the important thing is that when we encounter a branching condition uh, or a loop, we have to evaluate the, 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 the phi, the branching condition phi. Um, 
And of course, this is evaluated in the knowledge state, uh, m at time t. Uh, and the rest is simpler. When we have a nontic action, we just have to uh, progress uh, um, the, 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 the effect of the nontic action on, on, the, on the possible um, states. And when we, have, when we have an epistemic action, we have to uh, receive the, obs the observation and to expand our knowledge state by, by the observation. So I'm going to give examples for the, these three cases. So suppose, so we start with, um, uh, so we start uh, with this, uh, this knowledge state, okay, which contains these two possible states, and then we do the progression by the ontic action switch x1. So um, basically what we do is that for each of these states, we're going to take the, the possible next states corresponding to the execution of the ontic action, which means that, of course, I mean, we, uh, this one will transform into that one and this one into that one. Okay? So this will be the new set of states after this action is performed. And then we perform a second uh, ontic action, which is a non-deterministic action, Rainit x1. Uh, Rainit x1 uh, change the value, uh, I mean, keeps the value of x2 and x3 as they were, and can do anything with x1. So this state can transform into this one or that one, and this one into this one or that one. So we have now this new set of possible states. And then, um, uh, suppose that we perform the epistemic action test x1 and x2 and re we receive the observation not x1 and x2. Then we just filter this set of states by getting rid of all states that do not satisfy not x1 and x2. And we keep, we are left with these three possible states. Okay, so now let's define formally a uh, knowledge space planning problems. So, so a few words about classical AI planning. So in classical planning, we have a, a set of initial states and a set of goal states, which are usually described succinctly, I mean, using some logical language. And we have a set of actions which, whose effect are described succinctly in, just, in the same way as, as, as we uh, talked a few minutes ago. And the output is a standard plan, uh, or often called a policy. And a policy is a tree or a, a, a directed acyclic graph containing observ observations and actions. And what is important, and this is the, the, the important difference with knowledge-based programs, is that branching conditions bear directly on observations. Branching conditions are on the current state on, on, and observations. They, they, they do not use complex formulas. Um, so for instance, in a standard policy, I would say, um, I test whether uh, x1 is, is true or false, and then the next branching would be on, on x1, and not on some complex formula. Um, OK, so now, so formally, a knowledge-based planning problem consists of an initial knowledge state, right? uh, a goal knowledge state, and we say that pi, an, an, uh, that the knowledge-based program pi is a valid plan for p if it terminates, and for every possible sequence of states, uh, S0 in the initial knowledge state, and, so, and S final in the final knowledge state, then M final uh, satisfies the goal. So the, if you want to compare knowledge-based programs with, with standard plans, standard, standard policies, we have to express, I mean, to, we have to, to, to to specify which subclass of knowledge-based programs these standard policies consist of. Uh, and the simplest way of defining them is to say that a standard policy is a knowledge-based program in which the last action executed before any branching condition if phi or y phi is an epistemic action A such that phi is one of the possible observations for A. So it means that um, a branching condition has to be something like, uh, if I know uh, some other observation and the, the action just before was a, a, an epistemic action such that the observation was one of the possible observations for, for the action. Um, it's very simple to show that in terms of expressivity, there is no difference between the, the, them. I mean, the, any 
for any uh, knowledge based program Pi, there exists a standard policy Pi prime which is equivalent to Pi. So equivalency is a little bit tricky to define, but in, intuitively it means that they have the same execution traces. I mean, that executing in the same environment, they will lead to the same observations and the same actions. Uh, so in terms of expressivity, there, there's no difference, but then differences will come in terms of succinctness and, and complexity. Um, so let's come back to our, uh, to our diagnosis example. So again, the initial knowledge state is, is uh, this one. The goal knowledge state is to have all three components working correctly. And the actions are test I and repair I for every I uh, equals one, two, three. And so we had this, remember, we had this uh, very simple uh, knowledge, based, knowledge, based, knowledge based program. And if we, we, we can, if we want to, to compute the, the, the standard policy, which is equivalent to pi, I mean, we get this standard policy. So you see here that the, the, the branching conditions, so we don't refer, we, we don't use any epistemic modalities anymore, and we don't need them, because we are sure that the, the, the branching condition refers to one of the possible observations for the, the, the epistemic action, which was just before, okay? And the, the, the same, the same, the same here. Okay, so here we allow that. Okay, we allow to have to have branching conditions that refer to an epistemic action which was not done just before, but sometime before. But this is still okay. No? Uh, so the, you see that the. So, sorry. It's repair. I repair. Replace two different words. I didn't get it. No. Uh, sorry, sorry I, I said repair. Okay, so the same. Okay, repair and replace is the same. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that was repair. Yeah. 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 The effect is the same. I mean, uh, the, the component is working. Yeah. Um, you see that the standard policy is uh, less easy to read, less easy to generate, also, I mean, less, uh, and, and, and also less, much less compact. Yeah. Um, so this, is, this would be a positive point for knowledge space program. And what, what, what is the price to pay for that? The price to pay is reactivity. Uh, executing, uh, executing a standard policy is cheap in terms of uh, online time. Uh, a standard policy is, uh, in the best case, a tree. In, in more complex cases, a directed acyclic graph. Uh, but finding the next action to execute, I mean, once we get an observation, is always uh, uh, you can always do it very quickly, actually, in, in constant time. Yeah. But uh, for a knowledge-based plan, when we have to evaluate a branching condition, then uh, we have to decide whether the current knowledge state implies the, the, the branching condition, which, is, uh, which amounts to a, a validity, a validity test uh, in S5, okay, a consequence test in S5, which is, of course, NP-hard and, and co-NP-hard. Yeah. Because uh, we, we, we may have, uh, uh, be, because actually, uh, so why is it NP hard and co NP hard? Because the, the, um, actually the, um, the knowledge state is represented using the, the logic of only knowing. And in, in the branching condition, we may have positive or negative knowledge. And, and, and the, the complexity of this, uh, of deciding whether O phi uh, implies some uh, epistemic formula that does not contain any only knowing modality is probably delta P2 complete, but it's NP hard and co NP hard. Yes? Ten minutes, okay. Um, okay, so, so the, the trade-off is that. On the one hand, knowledge-based programs are more compact, more succinct, <laughs> take less space. On the other hand, they are more difficult to execute. I mean, they take more time for online ex execution. Yeah. Uh, and we, first, we want to make the succinctness argument more formal. Yeah. And so we get uh, three results. Okay, so the, the first result, so there is a small mistake here. Actually, it's unless P uh, poly uh, contains NP, so I have no time to explain what P poly is. Okay. Uh, actually, the, the, I mean, if P poly were to contain uh, NP, then the, uh, the polynomial hierarchy would collapse at the second level, which is extremely unlikely. So unless this extremely unlikely uh, assumption were true, wide-free knowledge-based programs, so uh, knowledge-based programs without loops, 
with atomic branching conditions are more are strictly more succinct than white free standard policies. And the sketch of proof is, is as follows. Uh, for each integer n, we built uh, a polysized knowledge-based program that basically reads uh, uh, a CNF formula uh, by reading the, the, the clauses one after the other. We read the, the literals of the clauses one after the other. And then it will, out, it will either output a model of the formula, if there is, if there is a model, or output that the formula is, is unsatisfiable, if it isn't satisfiable. <laughs> And if there were a family of policy standard policies uh, uh, solving this problem, then it would imply that uh, we, we would have found a polynomial algorithm for three sets, uh, which is very unlikely. The, if we now move to knowledge-based program, programs with loops, uh, then again we, we can show that they are more, more succinct than standard policies with loops. I think I'm going to skip the proof for that thing. And um, more I mean, simpler, we also show that knowledge-based programs are more succinct than uh, knowledge-based programs without loops. Okay, so now let's talk about plan existence. So we had, a, I mean, in, in our companion paper, we had a detailed study of plan verification. So plan, plan verification is the, the the following decision problem. So the, the input is a, a planning problem plus there is something missing that plus a knowledge based program, pi. And the question is, is pi valid for p? Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this again. And uh, so now today we focus on, um, on plan existence. So the, the plan exist the KBP existence problem, the, the input consists of um, a planning problem. And the question is, is there a valid knowledge based program uh, pi for p? And, and since one of the interests of using knowledge-based programs for planning is that they are more succinct, it makes sense to uh, look for the bounded, uh, the bounded size plan, uh, K KBP existence problem. We look for small KBPs. So in that case, the, the bounded KBP existence problem is defined. So the input is defined as a planning problem plus an integer K encoded in unary. In, in, in unary because we want really to have small uh, programs as output. And the question is, is there a valid KBP uh, with, whose size is no more than K? And so we get uh, a table of results I mean, with actually two, two open results. Uh, actually, some of these results are um, um, straightforward color, color corollaries from um, known results in planning. Actually, this is the case for these four. Um, we know, actually, that in terms of expressivity, there is no difference between the, 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 these two families of, of plans. Um, the, the existence of a knowledge-based program for a planning problem is equivalent to, existence, to the existence of a standard policy for the, the planning problem. So it means that for each of these uh, four decision problems, uh, I mean, so let's take this one. We, we know that the plan existence problem for standard plans is 2x time complete <laughs> because it is equivalent to the existence of a valid KBP. I mean, the, the, the complexity for uh, the, the KBP existence problem is, is the same. Okay, so, that, so we get these four results for, for free. You know. Uh, so now, what about bounded, the bounded case, which, so of course, I mean, for the unbounded case, it makes no difference because we, we don't care about size, but uh, for the bounded case, it makes a difference between standard plans and KBPs because KBPs are usually much shorter. Yeah. So in the general case, I mean, if we don't make any restriction on the knowledge-based program, uh, then the, the complexity of plan existence is space complete. So membership is actually easy. We, we, just, I mean, we just guess uh, a plan pi of, of size no more than k, and we verify the plan. We verify, verify that the plan is valid, and we know that plan verification is, is space complete. Uh, so we get, we get a problem in nx space, which is equal to x space. And for hardness, we, 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 we have actually a, um, a, a preliminary solution from this plan verification problem. Yeah. The idea of the proof is that we, we built a planning problem. So we start with pi, and we built a planning problem pi, 
prime, um, so, such that every valid plan for p prime is equivalent to pi, and we fix k to the, the, the size of pi. Um, five minutes, okay, that's enough. Okay, so now, uh, if we make the following restriction that the, plan, the, the KBPs should be wire free, should not have loops, um, uh, then the plan uh, existence prime falls down to sigma 3p, sigma 3p complete. The membership, uh, we just guess a plan of, of size no more than k, and we verify it, and we know that plan verification is in pi 2p, so we just move one level up in the, in the hierarchy. We are in the third level, and the hardness is not too difficult. I mean, the, the reduction from QBF 3 uh, exists. Um, and for while free with ontic actions only, uh, this is actually almost, this is a corollary of known results in planning, which says that uh, um, I, because here we don't, if we have only ontic actions, we don't have any observations, okay? So we don't need any branching. Uh, it, it means that if we have a valid plan, then we also have a valid plan with no branching and which will not be larger. So, uh, the complexity would be equivalent to the complexity of the existence of a standard plan without branching, and this, this is known. Yeah. Okay, and then the last results are about purely epistemic plans, so uh, plans that involve only epistemic actions. Uh, uh, so the state is never going to change. I mean, the, um, the, only, the only actions are um, meant to bring some new knowledge. Yeah. Uh, we have an epistemic goal in the end. Yeah. Uh, and surprisingly, so this this Problems have not been uh, uh, have not have not got much attention in the AI, AI planning literature. So we see, uh, this is why we have we have results e even for the unbounded case. Yeah. Uh, so for the unbounded case, we have a p space completeness result. Uh, so for membership, so the the specificity, specificity of these epistemic actions is that we don't need to perform them uh, twice I mean, because um, since the state is not going to change, I mean, if we, if we perform an, an, action, an epistemic action twice in the same state, we get twice the same result. So we just need to do it once or none, uh, which means that the, 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 the height of the, height of the of the plan is uh, at most number of epistemic actions. So it, the, the height of the plan is polynomial. And uh, searching a polynomial height tree can be done in P space. So that shows membership in P space. And hardness comes from uh, reduction by, from, QBF, from QBF. And lastly, um, the, 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 we had one more restriction that, so, of wild free plants with uh, epistemic actions, and we require the, the goal to be positive epistemic. So I didn't say much about goals, but we assume that goals, goals can be any, uh, any purely uh, epistemic formulas. So in, in we can have ne negatively epistemic goals, such as the by goal is. Uh, uh, not KP, right? I don't, uh, my goal is not to know P. Uh, in most cases, in single agent frameworks, I insist that we have a single agent, it makes little sense to have, I think it makes little sense to have such negative goals. And there are some cases where it makes sense, but in most cases, goals are positive knowledge. I mean, my goal is to, to, to know something or actually to, yeah, to know the value of something. And, I mean, ignorance goals are um, a little bit weird. And in that case, if we have only positive goals, then for the unbounded case, we fall down to coin P complete for a very simple reason, because in that case, it's the, since uh, executing an epistemic action is, is harmless, which we just have to execute them all. And for the bounded case, it's, it's actually more difficult because we have to find the subset of K actions to, to perform. Okay, so that's the, the end. So, in the future, I mean, what we really want to do is to generate these knowledge-based programs using tools for planning and, and control or synthesis. Uh, uh, and there should, there should be some, for some connections with the, 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 the previous talk that should be worth exploring. Um, uh, 
Uh, and also, we're interested in, in uh, analyzing and generating probabilistic belief-based programs, uh, which actually raises many questions about representation and, and uh, of actions and beliefs and, and plans. Um, I think, I, I mean, to conclude, I mean, I, I, I'm still, I mean, I, I love knowledge-based programs, and I, I think this is the right community to, 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 to say that. And, I, and I'm surprised that they were used so... Uh, so little in, in AI, actually, and uh, especially in AI planning. Okay, well, take this last word. ...policies from which epistemic conditions can be related. I mean, you had situations where you had epistemic conditions and mm. where you did not need is there any characterization of when you can do it? In uh, when you can do it w without epistemic conditions, you, you mean we, 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 without any change in, in, in the size of the, of the program? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, because, because you could code up some, some of them. Right? See, of course, in general, if you get rid of the epistemic conditions, you, 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 you find an equivalent plan but which is much bigger, but characterizing classes of problems for which you avoid these exponential, uh, yes. I don't know. This good question. Well, I have a small question myself, because I have observed you present the, well, the Toulouse way of distinguishing ontic from epistemic actions, mm -hmm. right? Where you do not consider an ontic action in the sense of something that can be observed while the actual change is happening. So that makes it a bit different from the, you might say, the dynamic epistemic view of mm -hmm. the Consequences by agents. For first and then plus. It's mm -hmm. difficult to separate if the, the content of the actions can be uh, believed for because it's not known necessarily what are the post conditions of, of dynamic epistemic types of actions. Yeah, I, I didn't understand the question. I must. Uh, uh, ah, yeah. I think it will be hard. Yeah. Well, my, my question is would it not be hard to separate this way of ontic from epistemic actions if you are in a framework where the the, 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 the pre and post conditions of actions can be more complex formulas than up to a single believer large operator on uh, the objective formula. I don't think so because the, the we, we, we are in a single in a single agent framework. Uh, so I guess that any complex action can be simply decomposed by the the, the, the sequence of two actions, the first one being purely antique and the, the, the second one purely epistemic. It's like in, 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 in control theory, you have these clo closed loops where you first, uh, you first update and, and, and then you, and then you, you revise. Uh, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Okay, okay, okay offline, yeah. yeah. The job of the general chair is to choose a program chair and a local arrangements chair, and then hopefully totally back out of the picture, uh, cheering from the sidelines. Uh, so I, I'm really pleased, uh, that, that, and I want to thank Burkhardt and, and Ram for doing a wonderful job as program chair and general chair. And, uh, I hope you all agree that, that things are running incredibly smoothly, and, and, and the program is great, so, so thank you. I, I do know how much work is involved which is precisely why I want to be in the background. Uh, the other thing we do it, it, in the business meeting, uh, it, it has been a time to sort of reflect on, you know, what's happening with TARC, should we change things, what should we do next? Now, I would say about 10 years ago, attendance was fairly low, perhaps at the time it was not the best location, and, and I certainly had a serious concern, other people have been actively involved in TARC for years, had a serious concern that, you know, maybe we should stop the conference. That 40 or 50 people were coming and it wasn't clear that it was worth all the effort that was being put in by the local arrangements people and the program chair just to run, you know, a small workshop. Um, and it seems to me over the last 10 years things have really picked up. I, I mean, Ram will talk about the numbers of people here, but, but there seems to be a healthy number here. We've never wanted it to be a huge conference. The, the, Part of the spirit of TARP was to promote interactivity, and it's hard to do that with 200 people, whereas with sort of 80, 90, that seems to be a good number, and, and, and we seem to be getting about that number. And so at the last conference, 
I had three bids to host the next conference. Again, I, I take that to be a sign of health. One was from Ram in, in Chennai, and that was the, the, the winning bid, as you can see. Uh, but we had two other very strong bids at the time. One was from Carnegie Mellon University, CMU, Kevin Kelly. They have an institute there. And Viva Vanderhoek and, and Mike Woldridge wanted to do it at Liverpool. Now Mike has left Liverpool, he's at Oxford. Uh, so I haven't checked uh, that recently, if, if those bids are, are still, uh, if the folks are interested. They said they would be. Um, you know, when I said we were choosing India because we've never had an India before. Uh, but they indicated they would be interested in the future. So assuming that's true, we, we have two strong bids. And, and people in Munich, uh, Hannes Leitgeb has a, a large center. He's a, he's a philosopher, but sort of actively interested in issues of logic. And, and he's indicated to me that he'd be very interested in hosting uh, Tark at Munich at some point. So let me say that, that we do have this tendency of trying to move around. So, so my personal preference at this point, or we actually have a Tark board, and I'll consult with them, is to have it in CMU, assuming that Kevin Kelly's still interested, um, next time around. Next time around ought to be in two years. We, we alternate with lot, so every other year. More likely two and a half years. Uh, there's no need to have it in Pittsburgh in the winter. Um, now, we've always as well been very open to the idea of co-location and uh, with other conferences. So last time we had it in the US, we co-located with EC, uh, Electronics and Commerce, which I think increased the number of computer scientists. This year we're co-locating with ICLA, which I imagine is increasing the number of uh, Indian attendees that they can sort of get, that they can go to two conferences for the price of one. And not just Indian attendees, because I noticed the number of the people who have papers in TARC also have papers in ICLA. So, so again, they may help attract people you know, from, from Europe and, and North America as well. Um, so at this point, unless people, I mean, I'm happy to take this offline, but let me encourage people who are interested in hosting TARC or even more people who are interested in, in or know of conferences that we might want to co-locate <coughs> with. Um, I'd be very interested to know about that. Uh, and, and we can be somewhat flexible about things. This is not a big conference. Uh, and I guess the other issue, and, and again, I, I'm happy to, to shut up at this point, just turn it over to the floor to see if there's any comments. I mean, what kinds of things should we be doing differently? Are there areas that we should particularly be trying to nurture at TARC, given its nature as an interdisciplinary conference? Uh, again, if you don't want to say things to the, to the group at large, and I, I hope you do, but, but if you want to talk to me afterwards, I, I would be very open uh, just to suggestions on, you know, what should we be doing differently? Who who should we be trying to bring into the TARC fold? Right? So the conference has changed over the years. The initial conference, I won't tell you how many years ago that was, it was called Theoretical Aspects of Reasoning About Knowledge, because the focus was on what I know that you know that I know that you know, just reasoning about knowledge. And, and that really was, that narrow focus really did uh, occupy, I think, the first few conferences. The change in name reflected a, a, a shift in the kinds of papers we were taking. So now it's theoretical aspects of rationality and knowledge because we have far more papers that focus, for example, on game theoretic notions of rationality and solution concepts. So the, the name change was intended to reflect that. So this is a conference I like to think is, is somewhat dynamic. Um, and, and we're open to, to, to suggestions on, on where we should be going. So let me turn it over to the floor to see if there's any questions. And I'm hoping to get reports from Ram and Burkhardt if you'd like to say something just about how the local arrangements and, and, and the conference organization went. Uh, but before we do that, are there, are there any comments or questions? Uh, Hans. Well, just a comment. The, uh, the floor is open for <coughs> bids for the new talk. And May I enter another bid by sure. Sharon and myself to have a next talk in France? Uh -huh. so, and, and, <coughs> Paris, Toulouse? Well, you should talk to me afterwards. So that okay. I, I should say that hopefully with the bids come uh, promises of some support, local support, because we do tend to uh, run, we, we can't afford to do no, this no, on this, the... this is with a promise of local support. I can talk to you later. Yes, so, so again, so I'm open for suggestions, and by all means, uh, talk to me. That would be great. Any other comments? Or? So again, feel free to sort of come up to me afterwards or send me an email about both about... Uh, where you'd like to host, the, have the conference, and, and also as I say about the directions of TARC. And now let me turn over the floor to Ram and Burkhardt. I don't know what order you want in Burkhardt first, perhaps. Yeah, th thank you. So in terms of uh, reporting, there's only one bit of data to uh, tell you about, and that is uh, we have 90 people registered for the conference, and of whom uh, 42 are from 
outside India and the rest from India. So I think it's a it's quite a healthy thing for I think for TARC, for and for the Indian logic community as well. So formally, this in the conference is uh, sponsored by the Association for Logic in India, ALI, which is a very fledgling uh, group of uh, uh, it's a small community, and uh, the fifth the logic conference, Indian conference on logic and applications is going to happen start starting day after tomorrow. So I think it's a good thing for ALI and uh, TARC to meet each other, and uh, I think from the program it should be clear. And we also got very generous support from our institute, the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, on the occasion of its Golden Jubilee, which just concluded. I think uh, you've been seeing the exhibition uh, which we have by the side. And so that also uh, gave us an opportunity to host these conferences uh, here. So I would uh, thank the institute formally on this occasion as, uh, for providing the support and for having a Golden Jubilee at all, which helped us uh, to have TARC here. Uh, but that's it. Well, I think I should report now how, 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 how many uh, na submissions we had. So, 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 so we had 64 submissions, and we took, I think, 80, 80, 18 papers for the program, and I think uh, eight papers for the, for the po po posters. Um, now, if you, if you compare, compare this with the na num num numbers in the, in the previous talks, I think in the previous talk we had maybe 65 submissions or so, something like this. And in the previous, previous talk, it was a little higher, actually. Um, now, um, now, what else I should report? So basically, all, all the pa papers were reviewed by, by three people, from more, 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 mostly from the pro, pro, program committee. Uh, one thing to notice is that we don't have many papers from n n economics, we, n n which is strange, because I'm not from economics. And the reason, I think, is that the timing of this talk is a bit off for economists because um, actually the biggest conference in economics just en ended. So I think in future when, when we think about timing of talk, I think it's good not, not, not to do it at the beginning of, uh, of the year, basically. Um, what else? Well, okay, so, so during uh, my work as program chair, I discovered many things uh, that I didn't think about before. So, 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 so I was uh, not unaware of many things. Uh, and I think uh, for, the, uh, for, for the people that want to uh, run the co co conference uh, in, in two years or so, um, I will write, write, write up some points that, that I thought about it. Um, and that they may not think about it, and, and even even though they don't, don't know how, how to ask me about it, because they don't think about it. Um, and then maybe one last point: we are currently um, negotiating with ACE about co 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 copyrights. Actually, neither you like, like, like to have the full copyright, but uh, but, uh, but we don't don't like uh, like to give it to them. So we will see how how, how this works out. So yes. Now this is still, still in progress, basically. Okay. Uh, so, so this is the plan. Yes. Yeah, yes. Correct. Yes. Uh, and then also, also the pay, pay papers are on online, or maybe on, 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 on online at the talk page, basically. So, so, so they are also from the past talks. The the, the pay, pay papers are they are free of charge, basically. Um, now, but the plan is to also also have, have it on the ACM. Now, of the ACM archive. So, right now, TARC papers, all the TARC papers appear both on the TARC website, TARC.org. Yeah. And so, right, I'll repeat for the video. Right now, all TARC papers going back to the first TARC uh, appear in two places. One is on the TARC website, www.tarc.org. Uh, they're free there. Uh, and also in the ACM digital library where they're not free. Now, if your institution happens to have a subscription to the ACM Digital Library, of course, you can get them for free. But, but uh, uh, if not, then, then ACM will charge. Now, in the past, we have not given ACM copyright to the papers. I frankly don't see any reason that ACM needs copyright to the papers. They just need from authors an assent to publication, saying that you as an author are giving them the right to publish the paper. Otherwise, they, they might get into legal difficulties if they, if they put it on without that. So the negotiations that Brookhart was talking about, um, you know, right now ACM is asking that we transfer copyright. 
and I believe we should hang tough and not transfer copyright. I think we'll win, but that was easy. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Uh, Rocket. Yeah, I have a comment about uh, the general direction, which is that I think that we need to draw now to include psychology, uh, psychology and maybe even social science as as uh, fields which could participate in talk. For example, the talk that Rineke gave this morning could easily be regarded as a psychology talk. Uh, for other examples, uh, both Daniel Kahneman and Herbert Simon, novelists in economics, were originally psychologists. So I think that a certain kind of broadening would be useful because I think that the field that we are working in has lots of applications outside outside computer science, let's say. And I think that we should pursue that because I think we can influence so other Part of fields. the problem is, is coming up with, I, so I, I agree with you, it would be nice to get, so my guess is if Rineke had submitted a paper, like you know, in the spirit of her invited talk, it would have actually been accepted a talk. Um, again, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for Burkhardt, but I, I can easily imagine that, that you know, having been involved with many program committees, that papers like that would be of interest and would be viewed as being of interest yes. by, by the PC. I mean, you know, provided it was well written and all the rest of it. Uh, the hard part, of course, is convincing the psychologists that they ought to submit their papers here and come here. Of course. And, and I, I would welcome strategies for doing that. You know, perhaps Renika has some ideas. Um, and uh, so I, I, my guess is uh, that we would be open. Again, we don't, I, I don't think we want to take on all of psychology, but certainly the parts of psychology that, that, that you know, sort of touch things like theory of mind and certainly the parts of psychology that investigate depths of reasoning that, that we're yes. so interested in here uh, would, what I think would be easily within the purview of talking, even from, you know, day one, right? Reasoning right. about knowledge, hey, uh, you know, understanding what people actually do in terms of reasoning about knowledge certainly falls in, in the purview of Tark, but it really is a question of convincing that community maybe alerting that community to our existence, but, but convincing them to come. So if people who are involved with them, and, and, and Renika, you would be a good person to get involved here, uh, have ways of, a, you know, thought, thoughts on how to encourage that community to be more involved, that would be great. Right, great, thanks. Of course, economists will say they, they are a social science already, so we do get some social scientists. Uh, he had a bunch of people in his group who, who were quite interested. Olivier Roy, is, is, he's not here this year, but has been to quite a few TARCs, and, and uh, uh, is certainly an active member, I think views himself as an active member of the TARC community. Eric Packwood is, is in a philosophy department. So we certainly do have, maybe you're not seeing them here, but, but uh, uh, we, we certainly historically have had philosophers involved. Other comments? Uh, so Rand, maybe you could say something about the arrangements for this evening? Uh, because I, I think we're done as far as the business meeting goes. Oh, sorry, one more comment, Fang Chen. Well, it seemed to me that well, I saw a poster outside about the Lowry 2013. Uh -huh. You know, I, it seemed to me there's quite some overlap between Tark and Lowry. Maybe, you know, something can be done? Um, again, in principle, I, I'm certainly open. <laughs> so, uh, 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 Jérôme, were you involved with Lowry at some point? I'm not sure who. Well, yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, in principle, yes. Uh, so maybe Ram can say a few words. So we're done with the business meeting. This is just an announcement about. Uh